When did you arrive in Vietnam? I got there in uh, the early part of 69. Early 69. Mm. And what do you remember about the flight? The well, there was about, it was a full boat as far as an airplane is concerned. And uh, it was a, a code of silence when we first got near the place where we were going to touch down on the airplane with the airplane. And, and uh, it was like, uh, ooh, this is kind of eerie, you know, we've never been in this situation, but anyway, uh, we all got over that and we hit, uh, we touched down and we disembarked and, uh, we're walking to the, uh, the, the, I guess you would call it part of the airport. Yeah. And so then we had our assignments and, uh, all you guys over here go over there and, you know, that's the way it went. You, you referred to a code of silence. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the, the code of silence, I, I might be using that in the wrong form, but it was like uh, an eerie silence. Like, uh, what are we expecting? You know, are we expecting uh, dun 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 bang, boom, you know, and stuff like that? Of course, you know, we were told, you know, that this could be. But uh, what it was, was uh, it was just kind of eerie and quiet. But then after that only lasted for a momentarily a moment, you know, it wasn't long. It was just enough where, hey, let's respect this. And we did. So uh, what was your first impression of today when the door on that plane opens up and or your first impression of, of Vietnam, the door on the plane opens up and you have your first interaction with the reality of Vietnam? What was your first impression? Uh, I'm serious now is my first impression that uh, okay we're gonna play for keeps so that's the way i approached it did you were you certain given your job that you would see combat in vietnam oh yeah absolutely see my mos was 0331 that's machine guns mm -hmm. so uh, and and i got to play with that machine gun when i was there but there were other guys that had different mos's that Oh, they were just dying to jump on that M60. So I said, okay, you guys, if you if if you know this one guy that I knew uh said, boy, I sure would like. I said, fine. So I picked up an M14. That was my weapon of choice. I hated the AR-15, uh, but I, I liked the 14. It was heavier, but uh it could it could kick some serious butt, you know, if I wanted to. It's it's practically an M60. Right. So uh I, I took that bad boy. You said the AR-15? Yeah, it's like your M-16. Oh, okay, I see. So M-4, you know, yeah. nowadays. Right, right. Yeah. Um. Well, so then you you let other guys carry your M-60 and use your M-60, and so then, then you become basic infantry then with an, your M-14? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, uh, when I relieved that, that M-60, I mean, it was kosher for everybody to figure out what they want to do. And so I uh, said, so, well, shoot, that's okay with me. I'm just a peon now. Mm -hmm. I'm brand new. I'm green behind the ears. And uh, when that happened, well, you know, we all started doing it. And then we got assigned to the group that we were going to be with. So we all jumped in our 813 six buys and went down the road to the unit that we were assigned to. And I just happened to be in Bravo Company, 1st Mardiv, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. The first day I was there, I uh, got to know a few folks, got assigned to my squad, and I'm sitting there, and, and it's dark 30 now, and so I'm talking to the guys that are on uh, watch now, trying to learn and pick up any kind of uh, stuff that I could use. And so they got relieved, and I'm I'm starting to hang out with the other watch. Now, I have the last watch. I think it was from uh, 3.30 to 4.30, something like that. It was a, that kind of a deal. So I got one more hour and a half to go before I start on my watch. And, uh, oh, okay. So I thought the heck with it, and uh, I, I didn't sleep because I only had an hour left, hour and a half to go. And then I did my watch. And then as soon as I was done on my watch, I got a little sleep. And as soon as I laid my 
head in that bucket, that brain bucket that I was wearing. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but a frog, a frog jumped on my face. I swear to it. That freaked me right out. And then I went, whoa, as loud as I could because it spooked me out. This and is then, your first night in Vietnam? First night. After that went down, I, I finally got to sleep. And, and then the next morning, uh, I'm over at the water buffalo, washing my face, getting my canteen full and getting ready to go. I'm dog tired, but I don't want to show it. And the skipper was there. And he said, hey, uh, did you hear that little girl scream last night? <laughs> and he and I said, I sure did. And he said, well, what was it? And he knew who it was. And I said, that was me. <laughs> And he said, what happened? I told him, I said, sir, if you got a moment to spare, let me tell you, a freaking frog jumped on my face. And he said, not. And I went, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When you're on that plane on the way in to Da Nang in early 69, suppose the Marine next to you asks you, what is this all about? Why, why are we going to Vietnam in 1969? What's, what's the point of this? What, what there was there, there was no uh, active uh, conversation about that, you know, during that time. Uh, we were all here. See, if you remember right, if you remember the the Navy vessel called the USS Pueblo. Pueblo, yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, right at that time, uh, when it uh, when that thing was going on, that's what made me and three of my other buddies said, "Hey, let's get out of here and join." Yeah, let's join the Marine Corps because my whole family's been in the Marines in World War II, Korea, you name it. And so uh, and my brother was just came back and I'm there now, you know. So the, the Pueblo incident is what inspired you? To it was what made me sign up, yeah. It was August the 12th, 1969. We were walking around. This is in Oklahoma Hills now. Uh, that, that was the name of the operation. We got into one of the bodacious, baddest firefights I've ever seen, was ever in too. But April the 30th was just as nasty too. But August the 12th, uh, there was a lot of us and there was a whole bunch of them, but we didn't uh, retreat, we kept going. But we had them to retreat, and we kicked some serious butt. And that was a gunfight. That was a real serious gunfight. We crossed this little river here, and we all got on line. I'm the last one on line to the left. There's like about, oh, we're about uh, a company strong. And we're all single line. And we're about, oh, I'd say about 15, maybe 20 feet apart to my uh, adjacent right. And it was a cornfield, flatter in a pancake. And then there's about uh, about 100 yards ahead of me is a tree line, about 100 yards, maybe 75. Anyway, we did about two or three steps and then all hell broke loose. And boom, boom, bang, it's, it was going on pretty fierce. Lots of machine guns going off and Man, we're in a fight to the end. Well, I tell you, I hit the ground. Now, believe it or not, there was a little twig of a weed about that big, about that tall, and I hit the deck, and I'm behind this weed. I'm going, this is my cover. So I got my uh, good old M14, and I just started whipping, boy. I, I went through several magazines until I had one magazine left. Now, we got up and we approached it. We were... Uh, well, it's sort of like like John Wayne, let's go, you know. So we charged that tree line. We got in there and we cleaned and mopped it up. And after about oh about four hours of that, I would say four, maybe five hours of that, uh, we cleaned up our wounded and and licked our wounds and started to secure the area that was around us. I was mostly concerned about my left flank because my left flank was pretty open, but not that bad. I wanted to, you know, secure my area because I'm the last man on that end. So I cleaned that. And then, and then as soon as we, we got hit, 
the the guy right next to me, I swear to God, he was standing there and a mortar hit him right on top of the head. I'm looking, I went, God bless America. Look at this. He was gone, but I didn't let that bother me. Uh, I couldn't, I didn't want to let that bother me. I just went ahead and started to do my thing and I just started doing it and started shooting and got the seniority of it. And as soon as we hit that tree line, you know, we uh, kept shooting and then uh, got some more ammo and started uh, to uh, secure the area that we were at. When the mortar hits that guy and he, in a sense, disappears and you say, um, I couldn't let it bother me, is that because in the in the context of that firefight your adrenaline's going and you know I, I often you know i used to ask veterans well what were you thinking when the battle started and they and i don't ask anymore because they 99 percent of the time they say nothing you're not thinking anything you're just you're just responding to your training is that is that what that is just kind of like um you gotta let it block your brain yeah. <laughs> if if you if if you don't let it block, if if you keep thinking that, you're a dead man. After a while, I got to be squad leader because, uh, you know, there's casualties here and there on small little skirmishes and people rotating, you know. And then I was squad leader and, uh, oh, I love those guys. And they love me, too. And we did what we had to do. We were aggressive. Uh, and I told every one of them, and they all agreed the same way I did. I said, hey, look, if I get shot and I'm dead and I'm totally mangled, just just say, uh, just look at me and say, it don't mean a thing. It just doesn't mean a thing. And carry on. But keep your wits about you. You just said something that's interesting. You said that I loved my guys and the squad and they loved me. And then in the next sentence, you said you told the guys, if I get hit and don't make it, then what you need to say is it don't mean nothing. Which, yeah. which of course, stateside back in the world is not something you say if someone you love just died. So yeah. try to explain that. Try to put that into words. Well, I got you. What's going on in that world where you say, I love you, but if if you get hit and you're out, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say it don't mean nothing and just keep Okay, it. okay. I, I hear what you're saying. I know where you want to go with this. It's something that gives the other person a, a sense of uh, confidence in himself to keep going, to keep going on. Because if uh, if you see this old guy... And you really liked him. I mean, you guys were really close and tight. You, you ate lunch together, breakfast, and all that good stuff. Well, you know, you always go back and say, "Hey, man, you know, pull about a do bang boom," you know, and 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 uh, and then when uh, that particular person that you know that you really know, and this this is a really strange night. This was uh, August the twelfth. And good old buddy Ray, he was my good friend out of Wisconsin. We used to talk about his black 59 four-door Ford. Well, that he had, uh, he got shot. He always wore his helmet like this, you know. It was like, instead of right here, it was like that. Well, he wore his helmet like that all the time. And he carried an M79. And uh, everybody knows what a pagoda is. It's a mound of dirt where, you know, the bigger the mound of dirt it is, the more prestige you had when you were living. Could have been a priest. Who knows? But anyway, he was leaning up against it. It's about 2.30 in the morning. And uh, we're running around like wild Indians because there's a gunfight going on. And you want to, they're scattered. There's no front line. There's behind you, left, right. You got it. But anyway, he got hit. He's leaning up against the pagoda. And I didn't know exactly who he was until I got up there to him and I said, Hey, and then I recognized him. I said, Hey, Ray, what are you doing here? And he said, just get the fuck out of here, man. I go, what? And he, I said, okay. 
and uh, he still has his helmet down. His helmet is down, way down on his on his brim of his forehead. And so uh, I took off. I did exactly what he said. So, uh, and I'm out there hunting. I'm hunting big time. I'm looking for something. And uh, and I did. But then later that day, uh, morning, around 5, 5.30, it was starting to break light. Uh, we I went back over there, and he's still there. And I went, ah, shit. So I went back over there, and uh, I went up to him, and right where I was standing when I left, and uh, I touched him, and he fell into my arms like this, you know. And so I went down on the ground, and his helmet fell off. And I swore to God, there was a bullet hole, perfect perfect right in the center of his head had to be a small caliber because the helmet wasn't messed up and uh he was dead you know and i thought well shucks you know this guy here i loved him god i loved him anyway i think about that it's a state of confusion and and chaos and, and a state of shock everywhere. So you got to put things in perspective and and go with it and figure it out the best you can and and do the best help that you can to uh, better your your situation that's around you. And that's what I did. So you were just talking about um, Ronald Ray, and you talked about how you loved him, and but there he is now; he's gone. And in the context of telling that story, you you said that, you know, you had to go out hunting and that you were successful in the hunt. And so I'm assuming, obviously, that you're talking about the NBA. Oh, yeah. Or any other buddy that didn't like us. Yeah. So when did the, you know, the loss of your Marine buddies, did did that become a kind of energy for you or a force for you or a motivation for you to go after the NVA? I mean, some sometimes combatants in the war say that, you know, after after they'd seen fellow soldiers, fellow sailors, fellow Marines, fellow airmen get killed, yeah. then then they that that became a motivation for them to be even more fierce when it came to going after the enemy. Was that true for you? Yeah, I was uh, on that same term. I was aggressive every time I went out, uh, but I had my I had to keep my wits all about me, uh, especially when uh, when you're in a situation like that. And a lot of a lot of times, a lot of people lose their their composure, you know. And and, uh, and I can understand that, but uh, you got to keep your wits all about you when others are losing theirs. What was your perception of the nba as an adversary to me they didn't impress me but i respected it because they had guns why what was it they lacked that caused you not to be impressed by them i think it was because of their ability uh they didn't really have the gumption to do what we had to do we were more of a, an aggressive group uh, of, of, of humans than they were. We could think out of the box a lot better than they could. Of course, they were pretty good too, but we were better. Did you deal much with the Viet Cong or was it? Yeah, I dealt with them all with black pajamas and, and, and tire tread slippers and uh uniforms oh wow i picked up some really good stuff and uh you know artifacts and stuff you know because when it's all done you see uh dead people all around and i you know i went well wow look at that a cigarette lighter you know and i found a cigarette lighter and some uniforms and stuff like that and i put it in my backpack and uh then when we had the chance we went back on uh, hill 53 if i'm mistaken yeah that's where i had my gear so i've got 40 11 000 sea bags all piled up about 15 feet high and i'm looking for uh one sea bag and that's mine i finally found it after a couple four hours or so and i found it and i threw all my little goodies that i had in my sea bag because i'm taking this bad boy home so i threw my sea bag up on top and we went back out in the bush again, 
And then about three weeks later, I heard that the Hill 53 got hit. And I went, oh, wow. So uh, a couple of months later, we finally went back to Hill 53. And I went around and, and I found, hey, what, what part of Hill 53 got hit? Oh, the place where the sea bags are. Nobody got hurt. And I went, oh, wow. Oh, no, really? So I went back there. And sure enough, uh, my sea bag got blown to bits. And I'm going, God, bless America. So I lost all of my cool artifacts that I had, you know, because I really liked them. There's a lot of good stuff there. Even found a skull. And uh, <laughs> it's a little morbid, but I couldn't resist it. And uh, it got blown up, too. It had to be one of them because it was small. Not a baby, but. Yeah. Was was all of that... Um... Was all of that stuff meaningful because it symbolized to you victory or what What was it about that stuff that was meaningful to you? I'm going to say war is hell, but combat's a son of a bitch. What do you mean by that? Ooh. Well, when you're in combat, you do stuff that you normally wouldn't do. It's just that it's a first reaction kind of thing that you do. During the firefight, when when things are ablazing, uh, you, you go for the best, least resistance to get where you need to be, so you can stop this. You know, you, you my whole job and everybody's whole job is to let's make this stop already, okay? Because it's getting crazy, and if it don't stop, something bad's gonna happen. So I just feel like if I can make this stop. And a lot of us thought the same way because we always talk about this kind of stuff when we're eating our uh, ham and lima beans. That was a pretty good meal. I like that one. But when we're when we're sitting around the campfire, not really, but when we're sitting around talking about it, that's what we all think. We all think the same way. Which is when we get into a fight, we need to finish it as quickly as we can. Well, yeah, you know, you want to make sure that the things that you do mean something uh because if you don't you're you're a dead person so when you when you pick up those things then after the battle you pick up the lighter you pick up the oh the artifacts the uniform, you pick those things up then it sounds like whatever else those things symbolize one of the things they symbolize is that you and the other marines did their jobs and ended that fight yeah, we're not really necessarily, I don't want to, I want to put it in a different form. I might have uh, misled you there, but I'm not really looking for artifacts or souvenirs is what they say, but I'm not really looking forward or looking for it. Uh, it's just that it appeared to me. So I scooped it. I took it, put it in my pocket. End of story. I was up around on the CP. I said, Skipper, see that mountain up there? And he goes, oh, yeah. I said, I bet you there's some big-time activity going on. He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, why don't I just go and take a couple of hombres with me, and we'll go up there. So we went with, uh, there was a party of four of us. That was way too many people. And so we got up there, and the next night, you know, I said, we ain't going to do four. Let's take three next time. So we did a three-man deal, and that was still too many. But two-man team, killer team, was just right. I felt real comfortable. Uh, you know, we're, we're totally stealth. Now you have to be stealth about this because we're in their yard. And so we just watched them and, uh, we saw what they were doing and where they're coming from, where they're going, but we didn't go too far where they were going because they were going down and I don't want to go down. I want to stay up and then go my own way back because when it gets to when dark 30 is over, you know, you got to hightail it down and get back to the CP. And then I talk to the skipper about it and then uh, we make out a game plan and, and that gives, and then that went on to Intel and, uh, and we adjusted from that. Did you have exposure to Agent Orange? Oh, good. I'll tell you what. It's hot. It's 120 degrees outside. Summertime blues. And so uh, I look at my canteen. I'm empty and it's hot. I mean, it's hot. How hot was it? I don't have any water. And I come across this big, big, super duper bomb crater. 
and it's got brand new fresh brown water with this real nice pretty rainbow oil sheen across the top of the water because the sun is out and I can see the reflection. So I fill up that, I swished the water away a little bit the best I can with my hand and I dunk my canteen in and go a little and it fills up and I fill my gut full of that water. Mm. And then all of a sudden a C-130 comes by or a C-123 or whatever that box car is and it's crop dust and it's spraying stuff down. I go, oh boy. So I take off my shirt and I go born free and I get sprayed with this Agent Orange. And, uh, and this ain't the first time he's flown over this bomb crater. I'm sure this bomb crater is, is loaded full of Agent Orange, but nobody really gave a wild crap about it because, hell, I, everybody sees it, but we don't know what the after effects are about it, you know, because they all did come in 55-gallon drums, and uh, but we do get to drink it, and we do get to wash in it and stuff like that. And so, uh, oh, several, oh, maybe about, Three, maybe two and a half decades later, I'm starting to notice my feet, the bombs, the bottoms of my feet, the inner tissues out of it, uh, on the very bottom of my feet, and I start feeling this tingling, and it's tingling, and it's not stopping, and it's now it's, it feels like pins and needles. I'm walking on a bunch of needles, but mind over matter, you know, and then. Uh, uh, now I'm getting this burning sensation, or it's either a burning sensation or it's frozen. I still got it to this day, but it's mind over matter now. If you if you if you have control of that, then this thing is not going to bother you. But if you stop thinking about it and you uh, and lift this thing, carry it, it'll tear you up. It'll tear you up. But now I noticed it was on the very bottom of my soles of my skin of my tissue of my foot. Now it's starting to creep up. Now it's on the very bottom of my ankles. And uh, now it's past my ankles and it's growing right on up to my uh, my shins, you know, but it's not there yet. But well, I don't really care. Has the VA identified this as being related? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm compensated with it. I've seen I went into the VA Oh, several years back, and I see this one guy, he's in a wheelchair, and he's got quarter-sized sores all over his body and face and back. And I said, what the hell happened to you? And he says, man, this is Agent Orange. I went, what? He goes, yeah. We never thought of it as being a... Uh, something bad for our bodies you know matter of fact i took my shirt off as it was spraying that stuff it got all over my hot body and made me feel good because it was like a liquid yeah it was like uh walking into an nfl uh miss fan you know the fans that shoot water and sprays you down that's what that felt like an angel and i liked shower. it i liked it an angel orange shower yeah War's hell and combat's a son of a bitch, man. Is all I can say. Uh, you you have to adjust. You know, if you don't adjust to your surroundings, you might as well just hang it up. You have to, if you want to live. You know, you got to do whatever it takes just to uh, uh, to survive. When you say war is hell, I mean, I, is that a phrase? Well, it is. A yeah. phrase. Is that only a phrase or are you saying that war is a place of evil and darkness? Yeah. You know, like literally hell? Yeah. 